Good morning, everybody. Ashlyn Clonhane is my name. I'm, I'm Research and Development Advisor with the Psychiatric Nurses Association. You're all very welcome to the first of our winter webinars um, hosted exclusively by the Royal College of Surgeons in Ireland, the Faculty of Nursing and Midwifery, with our colleagues from the faculty, um, Anya Halligan, Catherine Kuma Vanni, and uh, Thomas Carnes. And this morning's presentation, it gives me great pleasure to introduce Sinead Frain. And those of you who haven't met Sinead, Sinead is one of our most vivacious um, char charismatic AMPs that is going to present to us today on a title which is interesting. It's making sense of mental distress. But the theme I, I guess that Sinead is going to take us through is looking at psychosocial interventions in the context of mental distress, which I think is quite poignant given the start of today and where we all find ourselves. And just to give you a little bit of background about Sinead, Sinead is an advanced nurse practitioner on the home based treatment team in Ballyfermot, uh, Lucan Mental Health Services, which is in Dublin 10, kind of CHO 7. She's been there actually since 2006. She has many alphabets behind her name, but just for your information, she's a, re a registered advanced nurse practitioner and um, a registered psychiatric nurse. She holds her MSc, which is her Master's in Community Mental Health, and has a postgraduate uh, certificate in advanced practice um, following her degree. Uh, Sinead, like some of us here, um, is a fellow of the faculty of the RCSI, which is, is, is a very, um, I suppose, prestigious award and a very comprehensive award because it does require that you look at um, the totality of your nursing experience in preparation for it. So it gives me great pleasure to introduce Sinead Friend, uh, friend and colleague, Sinead Friend, friend and colleague, it's hard to say, <laughs> uh, as she introduces us to making helping patients make sense of their illness with psychosocial interventions. I'm just going to brass briefly to my colleague, um, Catherine Klumovani. She's going to just take you through some of them. Um, our thoughts around housekeeping and where these series of webinars are going to go through the winter and just general information about that. Thanks to Catherine, we wouldn't all be coordinated in this space at this time. So thank you so much, Catherine, for organising us. Morning, everybody. Welcome to this morning's uh, webinar with Sinead. Um, uh, in terms of the programme, hopefully through the PNA website, obviously you have uh, access to the, the whole wide range of programmes coming over the next uh, nine weeks, taking us right up to early December. Lots of really wonderful specialist speakers like you'll have today with Sinead. Many of them are registered advanced nurse practitioners, clinical nurse specialists, um, and bring a wealth of experience and knowledge to uh, to our webinars. So I can see there's over 15 of you logged on there now, which is brilliant. So I'm just going to ask you all, there's a, a message gone up from Anya. It's a form, just click on it. Um, and we need that information. It's just your name and your email if you want to get your CPD cert at the end of it. The program is obviously approved for NMBI, by NMBI with CEUs for uh, 1.5 uh, hours and also by the faculty. But we cannot, we won't know who's at the end of this call unless you uh, just give us that information. So please complete that there for us. And the other thing is the questions and answers are open throughout the uh, session. Pop in your questions as you go and then myself and Anya will uh, present them and, and Sinead will talk through them at the end. So enjoy the next uh, hour and a half and uh, thank you. As Ashling said, uh, thank you so much, Sinead. We're just delighted to have your expertise here and uh, obviously we're all looking to learn this morning. Thank you. Good morning, everybody. Um, just uh, to say thank you to Catherine and to Ashling and to Anya indeed. Uh, for her techno technological expertise um, and hand-holding because um, technology isn't my greatest strength. Anyways, as Ashley said, my name is Sinead Frain and I'm an AMP in home-based treatment and I suppose in the context of home-based treatment, I have um, developed quite an interest in psychosocial interventions. Um, and I suppose uh, what I'm trying to do today is maybe share my knowledge and my experience of using some of the tools that I'm going to show you today in terms of um, helping people make sense of their mental distress. Um, just because sometimes when people present to us, they are so confused and so frightened by the experiences that um, 
that they're having and that it's important that we as practitioners are able to sort of imbue that sense of calm with them and allow them to maybe process and make sense of why they are feeling the way they feel. So I suppose when Catherine asked me to become involved in the, the winter webinar session, I suppose this and because it's all uh, online, I suppose I thought that this might be a good way of um, or a good topic to, to help get us, um, you know, to, to, a good topic to get us on the road and just it, it is it, it makes sense um even in, in the webinar function so just get going here now if my slides will move forward so in, in order for help to help people make sense of their mental experiences um we use a process called normalization so why would we normalize um people's experiences for them all right so it's like i said it's to explain what's happened to them a lot of the time when people are psychotic or depressed or suicidal um they can't make sense of why they're feeling the way they feel people who are depressed go you know i just can't feel happy i can't get going and it's just about being able to explain to them what's going on well this is why you're depressed these are the signs and symptoms this is why you can't do what you might like to be doing. To decatastrophize a lot of people, you know, when I meet them first going, this is it, this is my life, I'm never going to get better. Have you ever seen anybody as sick as me? Am I the sickest person you've ever met? I've never felt so awful in my life. Um, and it's just, you know, I tend to say to people when I meet them for the very first time, you know, you are going to get better. You know, there's a process we will get through the process and you will come out the other side and you will feel better. And I always then go back to the, you know, and I always say to people, we're having this conversation now and I'm telling you now you're going to get better. And when the day when I'm discharging you, I'm going to come back to you and I'm going to say to you, remember the day I told you were going to get better and you didn't believe me? Well, here we are, you're better and it's time to discharge. And it's almost a way of completing the circle. To facilitate hope, optimism and recovery. And as we know, there's a huge link between hope and recovery. Um, and, and normalization really does facilitate that hope, you know, and we need to carry the hope for our for our patients until they're able to carry it for themselves. Um, and it goes a really long way um, to strengthen the therapeutic alliance. You know, it, it does. People start to trust that you know what you're talking about, um, especially when they start to feel a little bit better. And it helps people feel more normal and less isolated. It's a very, very lonely place to be um, when you're suffering with mental distress. And it also provides one of the really important ones is it provides us with a rationale for interventions. Sometimes when you're asking people to, you know, try and get out more, try and exercise more, try and do this, that and the other, and they just think you're talking to your hat. But if you can normalize and explain to people why they're feeling the way they are, then it makes the intervention sit better in terms of their care plan. Lots of times people just want a tablet and they don't want to have to take ownership of their of their um, issues. Right. So according to Beck, who is like the seminal CBT guy, um, he would say that providing explanations for why people are experiencing certain things is really, really, really important. All right. And lots of authors along the way have advocated as well that we provide explanations to our patients. All right. So people often experience unusual experiences um, as a result of stress. It happens to us all. Yeah. Um, they experience anxious and depressive cognitions in response to unusual events. Right. And this might lead to hyper arousal or social withdrawal. So a lot of the patients we might look after um, when they're very stressed, they get really hyper aroused. They become much more paranoid. They withdraw from society. All right. People will say, for example, who hear voices, the intensity and frequency of their voices often increase in times of stress. Um, and this leads to the decrease in their engagement in social functioning and their medication compliance. So it all kind of goes hand in hand and um, people pull back from us in times of stress or pulled back from their loved ones or from their social circle or from, you know, their, their coping circle um, in times of stress. Um, and this then has a profound effect on their engagement, on their social functioning. And oftentimes this is the time when people stop taking their medication. OK, and it just, you know, an increase 
in levels of stress leads to hopelessness. So traditional approaches would advocate not talking to a person about their symptoms. Now, for though, for though, when I was training, you know, we used to actively write into care plans, do not collude with the patient about their delusions. And like when you think about this, like if there's a deluded, somebody has a delusion and everybody is ignoring it and nobody is talking about it, it kind of just reinforces that delusion, do you know? Um, and this allows the, the catastrophic cognitions to develop, all right? So it is important that we talk about people's experiences, that we talk about their delusions, that we talk about their voices, that we ask about their voices, that we ask about what they're saying, that we do all of these things to just, you know, so that it's not some dirty kind of secret that even leads to even more distress for the person, all right? And people generally rarely accept a purely bi biological explanation. They kind of know there has to be something else going on as well. So it's about, I suppose we're, we're moving away from the medical model and, you know, providing explanations outside of the medical model, which I think is really important for people as well. So if we look at mental health as a continuum, all right, so, and we move up and down the continuum all of the time. So, you know, there could be a time when you're feeling really healthy and somewhere in between there's stresses and strains and this leads to illness. You get better and you move back to being healthy again. So we all are on this continuum of mental health, every single one of us. Yeah. And, you know, it, it is really helpful that if, if we allow the patients to see this as well, draw it out for them, say, look, this is where you are now. There's no reason why you can't come back to the other side of this continuum. Yeah. So um, just saying to them, we all have a mental health continuum is often really, really um, useful as well. And I really, really like this quote from Mind. We all carry the seeds within us of our mental health problems, okay? And those who suffer from severe forms of mental distress are no different. And it is only because they found themselves in an environment where their seeds are allowed to flourish. You know, there but for the grace of God go any of us. Um, and we are all, you know, at times only one really stressful event away from tipping over into mental distress. And I think that that's really important to say that to our patients, you know, there are times when we are all really stressed out, you know, and I just think that that's a, a really, really nice quote from mind in the UK. So normal beliefs. All right. So what we know is psychosis can appear in normal at, at you know, in normal confusion states. So, so when somebody is detoxing from alcohol or somebody is uh, delirious or, or septic with an infection, um, they can become quite psychotic and confused, all right? And then the, the, the following is a list of um, studies that were carried out. Um, oops, sorry now, got ahead of myself there. Um, just to see how people would react to sleep deprivation. So Oswald and his colleagues deprived people of sleep for three or four days. The majority of people became psychotic and confused. Um, PTSD. Oftentimes when people are suffering from um, post-traumatic stress disorder, they have um, psychosis-like symptoms. Sensory deprivation was another one slayed. So they deprived people of light and, you know, contact, things like that. So all of those studies were carried out into normal people. Um, and they, what they found was that these psychotic-like symptoms can appear in anybody who is subject to, um, to certain conditions. And then we all have our cultural beliefs. All right, so Cox and Cowling in 1989 carried out a survey of 60,000 uh, British adults, right? So 68% of people believe in God. This was in 1989. I'm sure it's probably a lot less now. Like, to, I'm married to a man who does not believe in God. He thinks it's absolute codswallop. So he thinks that anyone who believes in God is you know, a bit strange because there's no proof of it. There's no, he just thinks religion is a way of organizing people into giving you money. But anyways, telepathy, more than 50% of people in the UK believed in telepathy. Yeah, more than 50% believed in the possibility of predicting the future. Le people believed in ghosts, in superstitions. How many people who are on the call today don't walk under ladders, think that breaking a mirror is seven years bad luck, 
you know, we we and we're all kind of a bit like that, you know, um, the child of Prague, you know, where is the evidence that the child of Prague is going to give you a nice day for something, but yet half the country when there's something coming up puts the child of Prague in their garden. All right. 25% believe in reincarnation, 23% believe in their horoscopes. Um, and 21% believe in the devil. So there's a big crossover between our cultural beliefs, our superstitions and mental health or mental ill health, because one person's belief can be another person's psychosis. And it's all very culturally re related and, 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 and interactive. So we just need to be careful of that. And when we're looking at people, and especially now, because we're become such a much multicultural society, a lot of the time, the cultural beliefs we don't know about, you know, certain races of people, we don't know their cultural beliefs. And it's really, really important to find out where one meets the other. Oh, and black magic, that's that's a big one as well. So there's a little pause for thought here, and I'd just like everybody to think about times when you have felt low in mood and what was that like for you? Was there ever a time in your life when you felt intense stress and worry? And what was that like for you? Do you have any irrationally held fears or situations or objects that you're frightened of? Do you hold any beliefs that are unusual or scientifically unproven? Are you superstitious, for instance? And have you ever had any experiences that are difficult to explain? So it would be at this point, I suppose, that if we were face to face and um, that we would be able to explore those type of things. So because we can't, it falls on me um, to share. Um, there are times when I felt low in mood and I will I won't lie. It has been it was really tricky. It was really, really tough. Um, and I suppose, you know, you can see why people don't feel like getting out of bed or leaving the house or doing things like that. Um, experienced intense stress and worry. What was that like? You know, thoughts are racing, you're panicking about stuff. Maybe not the irrational fears or situations. Um, and experiences that are difficult to explain. Yeah, like deja vu is one of those really strange experiences that's difficult to explain. And we all, ex you know, we all, we all experience it. And superstitious, a little bit, maybe not so much. But yeah, I would be a little bit superstitious indeed. So the Necker Cube. So these are just some examples of how you, how we often perceive things. What I want you to do is I want you to stare at the red dot, all right, and see what happens. So is it in the near or the far corner of the cube? Do you want us to answer? No, 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 that's fine. I'm just giving you a minute to do it. Right, okay. So the cube appears to flip so that the red dot, sometimes inside and sometimes outside the cube. Right. So the reason why this happens is if you look at the 2D drawing, your brain automatically thinks it's a 3D figure. All right. But the, the, it doesn't give you enough information to know exactly where, where the dot is. All right. So it's your best guess. All right. And your visual system will hypothesize uh, as to where the dot is. And for some reason, suddenly another hypothesis comes 